In this video, I want to talk about boycotts, separating art from artist, and about a children's author. An author who wrote beloved novels for young people about adventures in a world of magic, witches, and mystical creatures. Very often, it was said that their books brought the joy of reading to children. The adaptation of this series was a huge success when I was growing up in the early 2000s, and I was completely obsessed with it. I would watch it almost every day. My seventh birthday party was a teen party and all my friends were dressed up as characters from the series. However, when I grew up, I learned this author had extremely bigoted political views and was an active agent of hate towards marginalized groups. Knowing that, when I took a second look at the series that I loved so deeply, I could actually find a lot of hints of intolerance there as well. Things that just went over my head when I was a kid. This author's name is Monteiro Lobato. His series of books, Sítio do Picapau Amarelo, which I will here roughly translate as The Yellow Woodpecker Ranch, has been an uncontested classic of Brazilian children's literature for the past 100 years, give or take. The series has 23 books, which were published between 1920 and 1940, and I would bet you can find them in almost any middle school library in the country. They have been adapted into multiple films and TV series in the past 50 years. It tells the stories and adventures of Pedrinho and Arizinho, two cousins who spend their summer vacations together on their grandmother's ranch. It's a very idyllic location, completely covered by rainforest, and while Monteiro Lobato was a huge fan of English literature, and that shows a lot in the references that appear in the series from Lewis Carroll to Conan Doyle, the magic here is overflowing with Brazilian folklore instead of your well-known European gnomes and elves and hobbits. The breakthrough character, Emilia, is Narizinho's magical talking ragdoll, and they live adventures in magical kingdoms and literary worlds, alongside a super smart corn cob, who is also a viscount, a talking pig, and popular Brazilian magical creatures, such as the Sassiperere. Living deep in the forest is the witch Cuca, who is basically a county magical alligator and is trying to have the kids for dinner. You probably have seen her on Twitter memes before, it's this one. It's creative, it's imaginative, and for me, growing up, it was an essential piece of art to connect me to Brazilian popular culture and legends. However, Monteiro Lobato's adult work, namely The Black President or The Racial Shock, is infamous for the worst reasons you can imagine. This is a romance with which he wanted to introduce himself to the US market, and it was written for a US audience, but it was never published. US editors deemed it was too racist. In 1926, in a country that was watching films like Birth of a Nation, too racist for 1926 United States. Yikes. I will read the plot to you straight out of Wikipedia. Spoiler alert, I guess. The story takes place in the United States in 2228. In this world, racial mixing is prohibited so that blacks and whites remain genetically pure. During the 2228 presidential election, the white male candidate is running against a white feminist candidate. The whites competing against each other paves the way for the black party leader, Jim Roy, to win a majority of the votes and become the first black president of the United States. Bad futurology there, I guess. The happiness of the blacks doesn't last long. The whites don't take the situation lightly, they devise a plan to sterilize the entire black population, murder Jim Roy, and the white guy becomes president. Yikes. And I mean, not only that, Monteiro Lobato was literally part of eugenic groups and organizations who were very firm on the idea that the Brazilian people needed to become whiter, to become a more mentally and physically sane society. It is also very important to remember for you outside of Brazil that it was the last country in America to ban slavery, which happened only six years after the author was born. Those views are very apparent as well in the Yellow Woodpecker Ranch, where the black characters such as Tia Anastasia, the housemaid, and Tio Barnabé, a manual worker on the farm, are often the target of jokes from the other white characters, who are making fun of their intelligence and mannerisms. One of the characters says this about Tia Anastasia when presenting her to a court of magical princesses. I also introduce Princess Anastasia. Don't worry about her being black. She's only black on the outside, and not from birth. It was a fairy who one day blackened her, condemning her to stay like this until she found a certain ring in the belly of a certain fish. Then the spell will break and she will become a beautiful blonde princess. Okay, okay, I think you got it. This could be an entire video in itself, and I will recommend a few in the description, but 
I know this is not really the reason why you clicked to watch this one. I'm only saying all of this for you, viewer, to imagine a scenario. I'm going to assume that you believe racism is wrong and abhorrent and we need to destroy it. But that also like me, you grew up loving the Yellow Woodpecker series. Also, imagine that Montero Lobato is alive and very, very wealthy today actively attacking black people on Twitter and making huge donations to lawmakers that promote race apartheid. Would you feel comfortable spending $60 on a triple A yellow woodpecker game? I was always a huge Potterhead, as cringe as they come. I can honestly beat half the people who have watched this video in a Harry Potter quiz right now, no prep time. Actually, fun idea, let's do one very quickly here. Um, what is the name of Harry's owl? Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Name a Weasley who's not Ron or Ginny. I refuse to answer this one. Who is Harry's godfather? Is Buzzfeed for real? Name one of the Aurors. Mm, actually, wait. Uh, oh, Mad-Eye. Mad-Eye. Mad-Eye Moody. What is Albus Dumbledore's full name? It's Percival Wolfric Bryan. Although... He wasn't gay when she wrote that. If, if he was, he would probably be called, I don't know, Albus Leatherwood Gaga Dumbledore. Name one of the three objects that make up the Deathly Hallows. It's the one tattoo that I'm so happy that I never got. Did you know that Harry Potter tattoos have a much higher regret rate than gender-affirming surgeries? Okay, good enough, moving on. I have the wands, and the maps, and I've been to the theme park, and I drank the terrible ice cream alcohol-free beer. I wrote Rami on fanfics. I actually still have my original release day Deathly Hallows copy with me. I dressed up and I cried in a cinema listening to John Williams. All that jazz. I'm also transgender. Since I was a kid, I fantasized so much about Polyjuice Potion and Transfiguration, about the magic of change and choosing who you are meant to be. That choices are much more important to define who we are Redder than our characteristics, I guess, right? R right? I guess? I, I swear I will not quote Harry Potter for the remainder of this video. But it was still an essential building block of my childhood. I watched the DVD of Secrets so often that I believe there was a point in my life where I knew all the words by heart. Quaron's Prisoner was my comfort movie until 2019, I guess. And I still believe it to be an objectively great movie. I read Phoenix when I was nine. It's a 700-page book before I even read Goblet of Fire, because it was the only one that was available in my school library, so I decided to skip one, because I really wanted to. But one of my fondest Harry Potter memories was the PC Chamber of Secrets game. This Zelda-like 3D dungeon crawler with hidden rooms and classes and minigames. It would make my imagination run wild. It would make me so excited to actually be in a school. I would play outside with my friends and mimic the classes in the game using the spells from it rather than the ones from the novels. I would spend countless hours exploring my neighborhoods shouting Flippendo, Defendo, Spongify, as if my street was a castle filled with secrets for me to explore. This game was honestly my special, mysterious, happy place, scary and wondrous. Like Hyrule, but somehow even more little gay who loves literature class-coded. The Prisoner of Azkaban sequel built up on this dynamic of go to class, learn a spell in a dungeon, fight horrible monsters that somehow exist in a school field with preteens. Even more. There was a continuity feeling to it. The spells you learned in the previous games carried over, and I expected that I would grow up playing the following games in the same perfectly executed style. But then... Warner Brothers went and screwed everything up by completely changing the gameplay mechanics for the fourth. Five and six just became a carbon copy of the films, and don't even get me started in those abhorrent FPS Deathly Hello games, which are basically crimes against humanity. My biggest wish as a kid was to have a massive Harry Potter RPG game that would spawn different years, explore a huge school completely flooded with mysteries and things to uncover, See yourself as part of that world. Feel magic. And when Hogwarts Legacy was announced, it felt like it was tailor-made for me. It was promising everything my inner child had always wished to live and relive in a magical school game. I was obviously the exact kind of person that the developers wanted to reach with this one. There was only one problem. J.K. Rowling made sure that I never felt welcomed in her world ever again.
If you are not chronically online, or at least not on Twitter, you might even think this is another dumb cancelling story, that JK Rowling, a billionaire author, a feminist, could not possibly have said or done anything that bad to deserve this harsh response from the woke mob. She is progressive after all, and her books are filled with messages of acceptance and hope, right? There are literally a million videos on YouTube dissecting what JK Rowling had said about trans people, and I don't want to add another one to the bunch. If you want to hear what other trans people were saying about it, I highly recommend the Matt Bernstein podcast with ContraPoints and the new Jamie Dodger video, both here on YouTube, the link's in the description. But I will summarize a couple of things she said about a marginalized community that comprises about 0.5% of the population, including me. It all started in 2019, with a few weird tweets being liked here and there, by accident of course. As her agent put it, a middle-aged moment. Then she moved to attack the use of language that is inclusive of trans men. Next thing you know, she was using her influence to actively be a voice for putting more barriers, more barriers, towards transitioning in the UK, where the NHS waiting time for gender clinics can get up to five years for a first appointment. This is a woman who fell down a rabbit hole in the past four years, a slippery slope, from saying, I respect every trans person's right to live any way that feels authentic and comfortable to them, to straight out saying that trans women are not women. So much so that she donated 70,000 pounds of her fortune to support a bill so that people like me would be excluded from the legal definition of woman in Scotland. Her latest endeavor has been to say that it was a fever dream to say that the regime of the German Chancellor of 1933 burned books about transgender healthcare and have even been called Holocaust revisionism by some. And I need to reaffirm it. Trans and queer people were persecuted by National Socialism. This is recognized by the German government, and there are even monuments in Berlin in remembrance of the persecution of LGBT people, just across the street from the one dedicated to the Shoah. The first of the famous book burnings targeted the library of the German Institute of Sexology, pioneering research about gender and sexuality. Because, you know, Weimar Republic Germany was actually a quite fruity place to live in the 1920s. If JK were to speak to me, she would refuse to call me a woman or even a trans woman. She would make sure to refer to me as a trans-identifying male, which is language that is carefully designed to be used as a weapon, with the intent of causing shame, causing pain. And I swear to God, this is not an exaggeration. If you open JK Rowling's Twitter feed today, you will find no Harry Potter references at all. No fan interactions, nothing mildly fun, it's just, just hate. Actually, while writing the script, I came across this tweet from Matt Bernstein, which is the perfect example of what I just said. She has been fighting on Twitter with a random guy with 700 followers named Rajan for two weeks in a row. You know what I mean? In the past few years, people have also looked back into the politics of Harry Potter. I will not discuss this in a lot of detail, but... The biggest criticism is how neoliberal its worldview is. These green text here is actually a great summary of it, in my opinion. JK's worldviews really leak when we realize Harry is not really the antithesis to Voldemort that he is sold as, but is actually more of a centrist who defeats wizard fascism just to preserve the status quo of a society that is already very, very ethnocentrist. Only wizards have civil rights in the wizarding world. Magical creatures finish the series with no rights to do magic or to bear wands like Hagrid. Creatures that are basically humans, such as giants, centaurs, and goblins, are second-class citizens. Our hero defeats Evo and basically becomes a wizard cop to enforce and defend the police state of this wizard ethnostate. The only difference between Harry and Voldemort is that Harry thinks that muggles and muggleborns deserve to not be murdered, actually. But Harry is happy to enforce that anyone who is not a wizard in his wizarding world should not have a voice in government, or even be forced into slavery. They are happy to be slaves, that makes it fine, right? Overanalyzing a children's book, obviously. But it is definitely interesting to try and understand a little bit more about JK's politics and worldviews. Hell, one of the only black characters in her books is called Kingsley Shacklebolt. The only Jewish character, according to her, is called Anthony Goldstein. And of course, we have Cho Chang. Konnichiwa, Cho Chang. 
And yes, Hogwarts Legacy. The main enemies in this game are the goblins, which, as quite a few Jewish people have extensively pointed out, are eerily similar to an anti-Semitic caricature. And they have a secret plot, almost like a secret cabal in the shadows, wanting to attack the wizarding world, which forbids them to do magic. And your goal as a player is to crush their rebellion and put them back in their place of subjugation. You know, just like Harry would have done. Does this mean JK is an anti-Semite? I really don't think so. Does this mean that Harry Potter reproduces centuries-old anti-Semitic tropes? Well, I think you should ask that to a Jewish person. But then again, this is what happens sometimes when you look too hard at a children's book, I guess. It was never supposed to be taken this seriously. It is, at its core, a story about friendship, hope, and belonging. And as I said, maybe if Hogwarts Legacy came out in 2018, I would even be able to connect to it differently and enjoy the game for the hard work the developers have put into it. After all, it was still a game that I felt was made specifically for me, and that my 10-year-old self had been waiting for 15 years. But there was for sure a lot of discourse around it when it came out. Can you say that you support trans rights if you buy this game? If you stream it online? A lot of people who consider themselves trans allies still wanted to play it, because Harry Potter has been such an important part of their lives. How do you balance both your love for the series and your concern for trans people's safety? Should we separate art from artist? Should we pretend that Emma Watson wrote the books and then it's suddenly fine? Should you boycott Harry Potter? Honestly, I think you should play what you want to play, really. JK is literally a billionaire. If she would never get any more Potter royalties from today to the end of her life, she would still have more money than I will ever see in a thousand lifetimes. I don't think you need to do complicated mental gymnastics and donate the profits of your Hogwarts Legacy stream to trans charities just to justify the fact that, at the end of the day, you just want to play a game. And that's fine, I'm, I'm glad you're able to do that. Because honestly, I f***ing can't. Even if I pirated it and made sure that none of my hard-earned money went to JK and would never be used to hurt a trans person in the world, I couldn't play it. I would feel sick just by interacting with it. That's what she did to me. I can't watch the movies, I can't enjoy the books. Even for a nostalgia factor, researching for this video even, it makes me feel sad, disappointed, scared. And I feel the same when I open Instagram and I see my friends posting stories of this game, or I see a girl that went to high school with me posting pictures in the theme park. Or I see a new Wizarding World store opening in my neighborhood and I look inside and it's crawling with people all the time. I try to comfort myself thinking that maybe they don't know that this is actually happening and this video is also an attempt to talk about that, but maybe they know and just don't care. I really, really wish I could separate art from artist, like a lot of proclaimed LGBT allies seem to be doing. But for me, every time I see that castle it brings me immediately to every single time a stranger online has told me I'm a freak, that I shouldn't exist, that my right to be who I am should be taken away. And this is not a call to cancel these people, as I said, honestly, play what you want to play. I'm just surprised that people who supposedly care about trans people, who supposedly care about me, are able to have fun when playing a game like this, to fully turn off their brains when watching a movie. and get somehow hyped about a reboot series. Because when I try to watch my favorite childhood film, I can't think about how much I enjoyed being a kid, playing with my friends, shouting spells across the neighborhood. All I can think about is how much J.K. Rowling genuinely hates me, and is currently doing everything in her power so that I can't be the person that I fought so hard to become. Are we alone? Well, Daniel, Emma, Rupert, and most of the cast have stood up for trans rights, and I'm honestly so, so grateful for that. I think that keeps some of the joys and the memories that I have, and this weird parasocial relationship I have kept with them for the past 20 years. I'm always happy to see Daniel in his weird A24 stuff, and Emma in Perks of Being a Wallflower created one of the most important movies of my life. I'm really, really happy to see them standing up for us. And, and to Potterheads and Harry Potter content creators, 
I know people online will tell you to just read another book and while I agree a little bit, there are many other incredible series out there waiting for you to discover them. I know it can be difficult, mostly if you have been part of this fandom for decades or if you make your living out of it. But you can take baby steps, I guess, <laughs> from the bottom of my heart. If this video spoke to you, but you really, really need to watch or discuss something, Potter, you don't even need JK for that. Go to fun content, react to fanfics, watch a very Potter musical. Darren Chris and Star Kids are totally awesome in that. And it is definitely the best Harry Potter play that has ever existed in this timeline. I'm not usually of the stance that we need to grow out of the things we liked when we were younger. I still love a lot of them from cartoons to games to David Tennant traveling through time. But sometimes choosing to let go of things we love because we know it's hurting other people is the right thing to do. It demands courage, of course. And I'm not a Gryffindor, but I'm a f Aries and a trans woman. I faced a lot of scary things and I am for sure brave enough to say goodbye to the Yellow Woodpecker Ranch and to Hogwarts. There are lots, lots of other places where I can go and be happily welcomed home. Well, I, I guess that's what I needed to take out of my chest about the entire situation. I blocked JK on Twitter already a few years ago because I honestly don't want to hear about it. But as I am recording, there is more drama happening right now and I don't even know what it is. I don't want to know what it is. But it's inevitable, this stuff always ends up on my feed and a new Harry Potter shop really did open nearby, so I've been thinking about all of these things for a while. Either way, I really hope you enjoyed this video and maybe I helped you think about this messy situation in a new light, from a different point of view. As you can see, by the time I'm recording this video I have about 100 subscribers, so I'm really doing it from the heart. That's why your engagement here is super important for me to reach more people and try and find more time on my weekends to keep this channel going, because I do have a day job. Leave a comment, they do make me really happy and I try to reply to most of them. Like, share with your friends, that's really super important for this little channel to exist in this crazy algorithm. This is my second super mellow video in a row and I promise, next week I'll try something more fun. But please suggest, because I don't know what. 